of the 2012 Icon Awards celebrating the 21st year of the UCLA Longevity Center. Tonight we honor some extraordinary friends of the center, Steve and Shlomo Rechnitz, Dane and Terry Semmel, Dr. Peter Wybrow, and Sidney Poitier. Each of these individuals has made outstanding contributions in their respective fields and are truly deserving of tonight's honor. Also, thank you to tonight's MC, the talented Lisa Ann Walter. Good evening. It's great to be here. In mythology, there was Romulus and Remus. In music, there was two-thirds of the Bee Gees, the late, great Robin and Maurice Gibb. In screenwriting, there were the legendary authors Philip and Julius Epstein. And tonight, we at the Icon Awards have Steve and Shlomo Rechnitz. <laughs> otherwise known as the Orthodox Olsen twins. <laughs> now, at, at first glance, you might think that Steve and Shlomo are just another pair of six foot eight, 300 pound identical twins. You see them all the time. <laughs> but take a closer look. And you see that, well, there are two of them. They're singular when it comes to innovation, dedication, and commitment to community. And it's no surprise to any of us that healthcare is the hot button issue these days. As baby boomers get older, their needs for care continue to increase at a time when our resources are stretched to a max. Now, I've been on the front lines of this national conflict, and I can tell you there's no simple answer. But whatever your viewpoint, we can all agree that at the heart of the debate, high-quality health care, easy access, and low cost is something we all strive for and something we all want to see happen. These two brothers have found a way to make that a reality, at least in one specific aspect of the struggle. And they've done it brilliantly, and they've made it look easy. And believe me, it takes countless hours of hard work to make anything look easy. Steve and Shlomo developed TwinMed, an appropriate name, with a simple yet vital need in mind to deliver supplies to nursing homes. Together, they innovated the industry with the per-patient day pricing model a model that's become a standard for the industry and has produced higher quality care in nursing homes. So successful was their business model that they are now literally able to care for the people who care for us. From the minute I heard about their work, the quality of service they provide, and their pricing model, I wanted to know more. Now, fortunately, at 6'6", six, six, I met the height requirement to be their friend. <laughs> their work is the future and I hope other companies will follow their example. Let's take a closer look at the dynamic duo in action. So tell us about your company. Uh, TwinMed uh, does some medical supply uh, chain management uh, in the United States. Um, we've been around for about almost 20 years and uh, we have to make sure that nursing homes uh, are spending and using their supplies as efficiently as possible. I've heard a lot about identical twins and they can hear each other or feel each other. And I always say, you know, the night my brother got married, he got married before me, I didn't feel a thing. <laughs> you know, from 10 years old to 12 years old, we always knew that this is something that we would do together. We would share everything together. There are so many stories. You know, I remember one morning we both went to school and, and that's one story. And then there were just so many other ones I can't remember. <laughs> Look, we've definitely made our share of mistakes. One day in seventh grade, toward the end of the year, we both mistakenly showed up on the same day. So the teacher finally figured out there were two of us. 
And you know, we can be good entrepreneurs, but let me tell you something. It never hurts when you have two six foot eight, 300 plus pound people walking into your office and strongly suggesting that you buy their product. I first met Steve after coming back from my deployment in Iraq. He took a keen interest in me and wanted to know more about the Marine Corps and the military life. I've been fortunate enough to see firsthand and also take part in uh, many of their philanthropic efforts. Some of the ones include the Wounded Warrior Program with the Marine Corps care packages for our servicemen and women overseas. Uh, a lot of people say, you know, they support the troops, but Steve wanted to personally uh, get to know some of these young men and women who, who recently came back from uh, the, these long deployments. So I actually had a chance to take him down to Camp Pendleton, equipped with uh, stacks of greeting cards and $100 bills. He gave out a significant amount of uh, funds to these young men and women stationed down there and uh, thanked them for their service. When Diane Alger told her story to News 8, the country listened. She let us in on the last moments of her husband's life, their love, and the 45 minutes he got to hold his newborn daughter, her birth induced so that he could meet her. Some of you sent money to help Diane raise her five children including a man named Shlomo Reknich, something that's important who called Alter on the phone and made a significant donation. Well, he just told me he was a religious man and that um, he believes in helping people. He's a California millionaire who didn't want to be interviewed but tells News 8 he wanted to make a difference and sent her a check for enough money to buy herself a car big enough to transport her entire family. I've received some other cards from perfect strangers with, you know, $100 or uh, $200, and that was shocking enough, but enough, uh, enough money to get myself a, a minivan was, <laughs> I'm in shock still. <laughs> Why the Rechnitz brothers are as uh, generous as they are, um, uniquely generous, is a combination of several factors. Um, it's in their DNA. Their parents are both very generous people, have been always involved in the community, both in terms of uh, community institutions and for the welfare of the individual. Um, secondly, their religious convictions um, compel them to view their success as um, you know, being the trustees, um, to be able to help others, uh, to be able to make the world a better place to live in. You gotta give back. Why? We actually have a, a drug rehab group, and they actually uh, uh, start working for us. And many of them have gone on to uh, lead very, very productive lives. Our head of purchasing today uh, started off uh, in this uh, drug rehab program, and today he's married and has a wonderful family. Steven Slomar, unlike many other CEOs, and that they're very involved in the team members' lives, not only at work, but they've always been there to help anybody out financially or to be there personally for each member and I think a huge testament to that are the nar large number of uh, team members who've been with the company since its inception. Twin Med doesn't only mean uh, the twins, uh, Steve and Shlomo. Um, their spouses, um, whether it's Tamar helping parents who are uh, faced with special needs children, the single mothers who are struggling to make ends meet. Abigail runs um, an organization that is known throughout the community to help um, people with medical needs, whether it's medications, whether it's hospital visitations, or whether it's meals for shut-ins, or whether it's just taking people uh, to and from a doctor. Um, they're, they're a legend in the community. The Rechnitz brothers are tremendous visionaries. They assess the community's needs. They see the big picture. And when they see the big picture, they realize what they can contribute to the picture. And then they do it. And they do it with an open hand, with a graciousness and a charm that makes them really iconic in our community. I am honored to present UCLA's 2012 Visionary Leadership in Business and Philanthropy Award to Steve and Shlomo Rechnitz.
Thank you very much, uh, Kerry. Thank you very much, Gary. Uh, Gary, I think I'm <clears throat> beginning to finally get why they call you Dr. Small. <laughs> The truth is that uh, I have never heard of Gary or the Longevity Center. I was called, uh, my brother and I were called straight out of the blue earlier this uh, year and we were told about it and he said he'd like to have lunch with us and I said, look, it's the beginning of the year, we're closing our books, now's not a good time, let's do something uh, in the middle of the year, but he was adamant, he really wanted to meet us, he wanted to meet us for lunch, so we cleared our schedules and we sat down for him for lunch and we're schmoozing with him, schmooz schmoozing with him, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, out of the blue. He says to us, um, I'd, like you, I'd like you to accept the Icon Award for your commitment to quality aging and for promoting healthy lifestyle choices. And I said, what? <laughs> and he said, no, it's, it's, it's very prestigious. Jane Fonda received it last year. And I looked at my brother, and then I looked down at my double waffer with Cajun fries, <laughs> and I said to him, are you bored? <laughs> I mean, I look great, but get a load of this guy. <laughs> and with all due respect to Jane Fonda, there are different approaches to achieving a healthy lifestyle. Shlomo and I just chose a slower route. <laughs> and then I see the Don, uh, Sir Sidney Poitier, and he's here and he's getting the Icon Award for acting. And he looks great and he's got a, a, a skip in his step and he's full of energy. And I start thinking to myself, if I'm up here trying to convince everybody of my unwavering commitment to quality health care, Shouldn't I be getting the acting award and he be getting the healthcare award? <laughs> That's just a joke, Sydney. For God's sake, is he sleeping again? In in all truth, um, the 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 the, the um, the lunch that we had brought back poignant memories. It brought back poignant memories of me being in high school um, and being called out of class because my grandfather uh, was dropped off at the school because he had wandered again and he lost his way. And some good Samaritan picked him up and brought him, saw that he was Jewish and brought him to the only Jewish institution in the area. And I walked out and I'd smile and give him a look because I knew that he was my grandfather. But then reality set in and I realized that he didn't know that I was his grandson. Um, the UCLA Longevity Center does critical work. I want to thank you all uh, for coming uh, to support such a, such a worthy institution. Um, I want to thank my wife who, who actually guides me and guides us in the community as far as what it means to give health care uh, and, and volunteer for health care strictly and solely for health care alone. Um, and uh, I also want a special note of, uh, of thanks to uh, Jane and Terry Semmel. Um, we've heard a lot about them. They have invested their time, their effort, their funds, everything they have to ensure that the phrase Aging gracefully is no longer the exception, it is the rule. Thank you very much. I'd like to now uh, 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 just hand over the mic to my, to my uh, other 300 pounds. It's leaning on me over here. I try to calm my growth. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, Shlomo. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> 300 pounds, right. We haven't seen 300 pounds since our bar mitzvah. <laughs> okay, what was I going to say? 
that threw me off. This is great. I'm being honored by a dinner for a memory care center, and I forgot my speech. <laughs> well, I basically wanted to thank Dr. Gary Small and all the wonderful people at the UCLA Longevity Center for all the amazing work uh, that they do. It's truly an honor uh, to be a part of such an important, life-changing organization. Uh, as all our life expectancies are getting longer, these people are making sure that the golden years are just that, golden. Uh, I, along with my wife, Tamar, uh, are unfortunately experiencing firsthand uh, how devastating the effects of Alzheimer's can be. Uh, Tamar's mother was diagnosed last year with early onset Alzheimer's, and that's all the more reason that this organization is so vi vital and so close to our hearts. Um, I also want to mention that while I'm probably the tallest person in this room, except that guy, <laughs> I actually feel very small uh, being honored among some of the greats of today. Uh, Sidney Poitier, uh, Jane and Terry Semmel, Dr. Peter Wybrow, also accomplished uh, and who have made such colossal contributions to society. Uh, it's an honor and privilege for me to even have our name uh, printed on the same invitation. Uh, the only way I can still stand here uh, is because my twin brother is here with me and he hasn't accomplished much either. <laughs> in the meantime, in the meantime, I'll look to all these people as an inspiration and continue to contribute more to society, even in my own small way. Again, thank you. Now you'll have to bear with me. I have to say that <clears throat> it is altogether fitting that the Longevity Center honors Sidney Poitier tonight. The true mark of his greatness, the impact he's had on the world is not just the brilliance of each of his performances, but the fact that he has maintained that incredible standard for well over half a century. There are only a select few who achieved that level of excellence even once in their career. Sidney has done it year in and year out, in film after film, book after book. And his mastery of his craft is surpassed only by the quality that I admire so much in him. His beautiful soul. Sidney, Mr. Poitier, my friend, my mentor, you're an inspiration to me and to the world as an actor and as a human being. And I am so very glad that I could be here with you tonight. All I want is to make a future for this family. All I want is to be able to stand in front of my boy like my father never was able to do to me and tell him that he'll be somebody in this world besides a servant and a chauffeur. Huh? You tell me that, huh? Like a cold sweat creeping across my brow. Yeah. Sidney invented the African American film. He just got better and better. He invented it and then he perfected it. I'm feeling motherless. He just got more diversified and more courageous. He almost became an adjective. Stare from the skies. All me. There was nobody like Sydney. Yeah. 
On a narrow island in the Bahamas, Sidney Poitier was born, the sixth child of tomato farmers. Their simple life and his parents' example forged in him a powerful sense of himself, who he was, what he believed, what sort of man he would become. At 15, Poitier was sent to live with his brother in America. I went to America with much of my myself already congealed. I come from a culture in the Bahamas where we were 90% of the population, which allowed me to go to America with a sense of myself. Pride and entitlement I carried with me. I brought it with me from Kerr Island. New to me was the way the society was structured. You had segregation in Miami, very intense. My first movie. I was taken by my friends, the Ross Corner guys, and we went to this building, and I don't want to let on to them. But I don't know where I am or what's going on. And this is white wall. And suddenly on the white wall, there's writing. Then there's action. And then there are cows, tons of cows just moving and what? I am absolutely nuts now because how could they get all of that stuff in this building? Well, I was never so fascinated in my whole life. Nothing in life had been that impactful on my imagination. I had no idea then that Hollywood was a place where films were made. I thought it was a place where there were lots of cows. Then my sister Teddy one day said to me, what would you like to do with your life? I said, I would like to go to Hollywood and work as a cowboy. Good luck. One day, I'm looking at the one ad page in the Amsterdam News, and the one thing that caught my eye was actors wanted. So I went, decided I'd go take a look-see, and maybe I could do one of those jobs. I go to this place, the American Negro Theater, and I knocked on the door, and Ovar said, come in. I walked in, and there was a huge man. And he said, uh, uh, what can I do for you? I said, uh, I read this thing in the paper about uh, Actors Wanted. He says, are you an actor? I said, yes. And he said, well, where have you been acting? I said, in Florida. <laughs> Woo! And he said, OK, take this script. And I took my script. And I said, <clears throat> so where are you going to follow he? hit the ceiling, this man. And he came up on the stage, and he snatched the script out of my hand. He says, why don't you go out and get yourself a job as a dishwasher or something and stop wasting people's time? And besides, you can't even speak. Bam, the door slams behind me. First thing that jumps into my mind, I say, how did he know that I was the dishwasher? By the time I got to 7th Avenue, I made up my mind, I am going to be an actor. For no other reason but to show him that dishwashing was not going to be my life. Soon, Poitier's sights were on Hollywood. Unfortunately, it was a time when blacks were only portrayed as stereotypes. Sidney Poitier was committed to playing roles which met his own personal standards of integrity and courage. Since these characters were unavailable to blacks in the late 1940s, and he was unwilling to compromise, Poitier struggled to find work. Finally, a few young movie directors gave him his chance. Look, I'm trying to help your brother. Why don't you just shut up? You watch yourself, black boy. Watch how you talk to me. Just shut up. No Way Out, Poitier's first film, was revolutionary in 1950. This new image would challenge old beliefs. 
It was the first of many roles that would push the racial envelope. The defiant ones made America take notice. Sidney Poitier earned an Academy Award nomination for Best Actor, the first ever for a black American. I stand up. I stand up. I sit down. I sit down. Ah, yes. <laughs> stands up, y'all. Ah, stands up, y'all. <laughs> $240,000 and 13 days to make Lilies of the Field. Mr. Poitier is the first Negro to win such a high award, and the announcement is received warmly by the audience. However, when it came to the moment and Annie opened the envelope, I thought I'd faint. I thought I'd fall down. I almost did. Black Jackie Robinson, it's not, it's amazing to be the first, but it's, it also means only, you know, and that's not good. At that time, I don't think there were, there were any people of color even in the kitchen, and, and Sidney always was aware of this. In the early 1960s, reaching for one's dreams was just an idea for most black Americans. Customs and laws still said that some were less equal than others. Off screen, Poitier worked to change the balance. He insisted his films employ more black talent. In congressional hearings on discrimination in Hollywood, Poitier would not be pigeonholed by racist questioning. I am artist, man, American, contemporary. I am an awful lot of things, so I wish you would uh, pay me the respect due. Sidney would neither be stereotyped in films nor in life. Virgil, that's a funny name for a nigger boy that comes from Philadelphia. What do they call you up there? They call me Mr. Tibbs. If you want me to do this, not only will I not do it, what do you think? but yeah. I will insist that I respond to this man precisely as a human being would ordinarily respond to this man. And he pops me and I'll pop him right back. Was Mr. Colbert ever in this greenhouse, say last night, about midnight. And I said, if you want me to play it, you will put that in writing. And in writing, you will also say that if this picture plays the South, that that scene is never, ever removed. Good, that's me. Yeah. You saw it. I saw it. And uh, that made the movie. Without it, the movie would not have done as well as it did. I fell in love with your daughter. As incredible as it may seem, she fell in love with me. With the three top box office hits in 1967, Sidney Poitier was voted the most popular movie star in America. At this height, Poitier expanded his profession by directing and playing comedy. In a 50-year career and 40 films, he widened the gateway of opportunities for black Americans in Hollywood. If we want to know Sidney Poitier, look at his films. He brought to them his own values and his guiding principle. What you believe about yourself will determine your life. It was this young boy's belief in himself which has inspired hope for generations. To focus on the racial aspects of his movie career would be to miss a bigger message. His characters transcend the issue of race. They are about being the best person, the best human being. Tonight, we celebrate that human spirit and the man.
how I feel, what I think. I'm your son. I love you. I always have, and I always will. But you think of yourself as a colored man. I think of myself as a man. a response that I shall not speak. You've seen enough of me tonight and more would not be necessary because what you saw and heard of me tonight were the essence of who I was. You need not be taken across those days again. I prefer that you join me to look for the future that we all deserve. I would like us to say good night to each other and go out into our lives and do the best we can. Reach inside ourselves for our better selves because there is a better self in each of us. So rather than burden you with stuff that you have already seen or have already written and I appreciate this evening particularly because I am a part of the UCLA medical complex. They service my heart quite regularly. <laughs> they take extraordinary good care of me. They ask little in return. When they do, I am there. And I hope that each of you in this room will pass my years on this earth. I am 85 years old. I have children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. And my life has been according to the values of my parents. It is from them that I got my sense of self. So what you saw tonight is who I have been and what I shall continue to be. Thank you.